here's a count uh, of flights by plane. Uh, the other nice thing is that in addition to working on data frames and data tables, uh, data tables are kind of this faster version of data frames. Um, it also works, all of the same stuff that I just showed you works is if your data is living in these backend databases. So it doesn't, actually, it doesn't even have to be in R. So you can directly apply dplyr functions to connections to uh, these five databases, Postgres, Maria, well, MariaDB and MySQL are the same, really. Um, SQLite uh, and Google's Bigtable, which is a hosted uh, database. And then I'd like to get SciDB on that list, hopefully in the next few months. So that just gives you a flavor of what Hadley's working on. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. That's all I have to say. Yeah, Tim. On the uh, composable functions there where you're capturing the group by, is that lazy? It's all very lazy. Yeah, nothing happens until it has to happen. Okay. Yeah, so you can build up substantial. In fact, it sometimes is too. <laughs> it can be too aggressive, and uh, you can build like. So you can imagine. Well, let's say you wanted to use planes more than once in a downstream expression. It will actually recompute it twice unnecessarily, right? If you if you get too lazy with your computation. So he's had to add a function there's to force evaluation uh, called compute. There's a function in dplyr called compute, which says actually store this intermediate result, because I'm going to use it maybe multiple times, right, uh, for efficiency. Uh, but, but by default, it's extremely lazy, as are everything in the CIDB package, by the way. Nothing happens. I mean, you know, you generally want to be as lazy as possible with large data sets. Uh, you know, you want to avoid computing things until you absolutely have to. Now, that's a good question. Keith? So it only works with those five databases you have listed there? Not right now. Not generic ODBC source? <coughs> nope. Right now, it's just those, just those five. Yeah. Well, there's a technical limitation that would prevent ODB support, or is it just... No, a, no, it's just a matter of time. It's all brand new. Okay. Um, it's just... It's, 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 in fact, it's, it's not bleeding edge. It's got some scabs. It's, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, I mean, they put it up on CRAN um, because people were so excited about it. And then now you, know, you should see the bug list on GitHub. It's insane, right? There's a lot of stuff that just is broken. But um, so you really want to install, I would strongly advocate installing dplyr from GitHub, not from CRAN right now. Um, use the Dev Tools package and install it from GitHub. So, so I think they're just buried in in getting the basics right. It's, it's basically Hadley and Romain Francois, who's another kind of seriously good R developer. Uh, and um, I do, uh, yeah. So they're looking to other people to put the plugins for the back end data sources in. So write one. Actually, that's the next. Or have have one of your lackeys, right? Have your. No longer we can't come down. Yeah, um, yeah. I do know that there, that there are many. So Oracle is preparing a, a, a backend for dplyr right now. Uh, 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 what's that? MonetDB. Is this this column store? I, I've never used it, but so they're writing one. I think that I saw somebody. Uh, you know this. Uh, there's a there's a a more efficient SQL Server interface that doesn't use .NET. It's like or that doesn't that doesn't use ODBC. It uses .NET. You know that? I saw something about it, but it looked like it was still not ready for prime time. Yeah. Well, that not ready for prime time thing is being combined with this like slightly ready for prime. So I think they're they're working on that route okay. to get the SQL Server instead of ODBC. ODBC is a little slow. Um, you know, I would like not to be using it, but all my data is in SQL Server. But uh, but you can yeah. In principle, you should be able to talk to it much more quickly through 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 dot net. At least as long as you're running R on Windows right. through dot net. You know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I give it a few months, and there's going to be tons more. Uh, this is all pretty new stuff. Yeah, so thanks everyone. This is some, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a database guy, but I, it pays my bills, so that's what I kind of do. And, um, 
Yeah, there's an intro to, to several unusual database systems for R. So, uh, any questions? Or any other questions about, about anything? I know a lot about R, so you could ask about other stuff if you want. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that someone was working to uh, update R for the next four years. Who was that you mentioned? So, uh, we, I, I, that was Luke Tierney. So, Luke is one of the R core members. Um, and uh, Luke, the, the way R core is broken down is they, they kind of have mostly specialists, and Luke's generally working on uh, kind of R internals, as is Simon Urbanic at, at Bell Labs. And, on the numeric side, it's like Martin Meckler and Doug Bates and Fritz Leisch a little bit. And then on the stats side, it's like Fritz Leisch and Kurt Hornick. Uh, and then it, on, on everything is Brian Ripley. He's Mr. R, right? He like does everything. Um, but um, so Luke, Luke is the guy that adapted. Luke, Luke, Luke is really low level. Like he's the guy that, that made our version 2.14 support more than 32-bit integer indexing, right? Which was a huge change underneath, like a substantial. So R used to have this limit where you could only have two billion things in, in anything, right? I mean, which was severely limiting for people with, two, today, two billion things is not that many things. Um, and. Uh, so they relaxed this, and, and the reason for that two billion limit is that the integer indexing in R for, for arrays used to be 32-bit integers uh, that were signed, because the negative integer has got this special convention means remove. Um, and so, so he's, there's still not a, six, under the hood there's a 64-bit integer type now underneath the system. It's not visible to the users. Um, at the user level, to make things e compatible with the vast majority of packages out there, R is actually indexing by double precision integers now. So you get, uh, you can have up to 52, 2 to the 52 things, which is a lot of things. Um, and, and so he was talking about things like, uh, Luke also wrote the bytecode compiler. So R has a bytecode compiler. I don't, has anybody used the bytecode compiler in R? There's a function called comp, comp fun, you can compile functions with comp fun or just compile. Um, and if you've got like loops in your functions, uh, it will run faster. Um, if you don't have loops in your functions, it won't really make a difference at all. Um, but, uh, but it can make a big difference if you've got loops. Um, and the bytecode compiler in R version 3.2, uh, which will be out in October, is going to be 20 times faster the bytecode compiler in 3.1. It's going to be, it, it's already actually 20 times faster in R develop. If you install R develop right now, you'll get a substantial improvement in bytecode compilation, actually. It's a big difference. Um, so he's talking about things like that and also like the deficiencies internally in the language and, and how they can address it in a way. See, see, computer scientists hate R because it was written by like analysts and not, you know, and it's not like, <coughs> it's not computer science enough, but um, you know, in, in my opinion, if you know, there's no other choice, if you actually want to solve a real world problem, you know, uh, you're you're hard pressed finding a solution in, in almost any other system that that will be as as easy as in R. People say R is hard, but I see it almost as completely the reverse. Like, Okay. I think C++ is hard. <laughs> I think R is a lot easier. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, yeah, here, I'll tell you a story. This happened to me at work uh, recently. Uh, this personalized medicine company in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Foundation Medicine, they, they're using R and CyDB, and they wanted to, uh, they wanted to run in parallel on, in a CyDB database this uh, simple statistical test called Fisher's exact test. Now, not being a statistician, uh, I, I, had, I, had heard, I had heard of it, you know, but I didn't know really the details, you know. 
you kind of count things up two, two different ways and make a contingency table and you get some stats off of it. I, I, I knew the gist, right? So I figured, well, um, let's see how to do this. And then you look at the, there's a, there's an, there's a Fisher exact test function in R in the stats package that ha that is incredibly sophisticated. I mean, like it's a simple test, but it gives you these, this. The, the help page is truly amazing. Um, it's like a course on this this one test, right? So so you read it, it gives you all this detailed stuff, and it has like a Monte Carlo simulation to get stat to get like confidence intervals on the on the statistics. I mean, it's impressive. And then the references, it has like six references to papers in the literature that say this is how you do this stuff, this is where this stuff came from. I'm like, well, there you go. I've got, I had the, everything I needed to know about the test was spelled out there. And I thought, well, let me, if I didn't know about R, where, where would I go? And I went to like Wikipedia. It had a nice page about Fisher exact test, but it only had the most basic implementation for like the empirical test, not, not the stuff that has to do with the distributions that our customer was interested in. But it, you know, I had a little bit, but not not quite enough. But that's Wikipedia, so I figured I'll check out uh, Python, which is a language I admire and like, but I, I don't use it that much. But I I know a lot of Python people, and and I uh, so in this in the Python Scikit-Learn module, there is a Fisher exact test function, and it's also just the basic one, basically that's in Wikipedia, and in their help, it's it's nice. It, it actually says. This is the basic Fisher exact test that like 99% of the people want. There are 1% of serious statisticians who want more. And then they have a, literally a link to ours documentation. <laughs> and and the Python help page says, if you need to do that, use R, <laughs> which I thought was amazing. So then I went to uh, MATLAB, the thing I used to use when I was a grad student years ago. And it doesn't have a Fisher exact test, but they will sell you a statistics toolbox for $1,500 that has a Fisher exact test in it. And it, it does what Python does. It's just the, the most basic possible Fisher exact. It doesn't do anything, right? It's, it's very yeah. lame. So then, and language after language, Julia, same way, the most basic test, right? Uh, with no documentation. Uh, Mathematica, which normally has really good documentation, also, in this case, had bad documentation and the most basic test, and you weren't really sure how it was computing it. You know, language after language after language, the only one that satisfied our needs was, was R. And, you know, so, I mean, if you don't know what to do, and Wikipedia isn't helping, and you have some mathematical question about a real applied algorithm, try just looking at the help pages in R. It's, it's really amazing. So R is, Tim said R is a, a, a programming language, which is true. It's, it has a formal specification. John Chambers, the, the Red Book, it's a formal language. We are using one implementation of that language. S is a different implementation of that language, which is still maintained by TIPCO. Um, it's also a, an environment, especially with our studio, is an environment that lets you do all this stuff. I, I, I wouldn't use the, the, the thing that comes with, with our, just use our studio, and, or don't use Eclipse either. Just give up on that Eclipse stuff. Use our studio, Keith. And then, I like my Eclipse. <laughs> And then, um, but it's, it's more than both of those, right? It's because of all the help and, and carefully written algorithms. It's a concentrated repository of human knowledge. That's what it really is. You download 52 megabytes that, are, that is an incredibly well curated and concentrated repository of, of our, our common knowledge. It's, it's, so it's, that's why you hear people talking about 40 more years of the language, right? It's, 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 it's not just a, a language of the month. I mean, it's a serious thing. So it's really cool. Yeah. See, Brian, I was, uh, I was kind of surprised to hear you, I think, just mention calling yourself, quote, oh, not a statistician. I'm not, a, I'm not, I, I know nothing about that. I'm a mathematician. There's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you've obviously been using R. Yeah, but I, I tend to not use it as a statistician. It's, that's interesting. How are you using it in a way that's not? You know, like a statistician. Well, I tend to work on large scale kind of numerical problems that you would normally see people using MATLAB for large scale optimization problems and, and big, big nonlinear systems, things like that, yeah, typically. Boy, that's, that's pretty fascinating.
graph theory problems these days. I'm working on lots of graph <laughs> theoretic stuff. He worries about everything except talking about probability. Yeah, I don't do much with that. Yeah, that's the only difference. Do you think you are you unusual in um, using R in that lab type way rather than a statistics type? Way? Yeah, my colleagues rarely use it, and I've tried to get them uh, to. I mean, I'm on a personal mission to get more people like me using uh, using R and, and getting rid of this. I think MATLAB's a real piece of junk, personally. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to see a lot more people using R than, than MATLAB. So yeah, I'm, that's kind of a mission of mine. <coughs> yeah, I, I think that, that really says a lot that, <coughs> about R, that someone is, like yourself, an expert user of MATLAB, is using it for something that R is not even really originally targeted. Yeah, well, to be fair, a lot of the core R authors are not just statisticians. It's a more general purpose thing. It does have a statistics bent, but, you know. I mean, uh, so there's this thing, it's starting to happen, right? There's this uh, guy, what's his name, uh, at Oak Ridge. Uh, I'm blanking out on his name. He, he writes a package called uh, PBDR, uh, Programming Big Data in R. And he and it's basically an, a really beautiful MPI interface. It, it's, it's, it's to run R on supercomputers easily. And they run it now at, at on the, uh, that, that's in the top five supercomputers. They run, they run R on that machine. Huh? You know, these are hundreds of thousands of network computers. Um, so there, are, and that's normally big physics applications. So, so if those people are using it, then there's hope that eventually more, you know, people will move off of MATLAB. Yeah, and the other thing I'd like to see go away is SAS. MATLAB and SAS are both. Yeah. Despite the former SAS employees in the room, it's it's just awful. The engineers won't leave MATLAB ever. <laughs> the engineers aren't going to leave MATLAB. They, they just won't. Well, the, the thing that MATLAB has going for it, and I have to admit it is really nice, is not MATLAB. MATLAB, the language, it, yeah. it's not even a language. The thing that's that's cool that <coughs> was an acquisition by MathWorks, and it's called Simulink. And that's actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I can see that sticking around forever because it's pretty neat. But the, but the MATLAB stuff is lame. Simulink is cool. So you'll have to, I mean, I have another talk. This is this talk I just gave at, uh, so there's two things that are going on right now that are, um, that you, you guys should know about. Uh, and maybe I'll come back in a couple months and tell you about it. We did, uh, um, one is I'm with uh, my friend Mike Kane. Uh, we are carefully going through generalized linear models. I talked briefly about this in the performance talk I gave on R. It's been taking forever, but we're really carefully going through GLMs and writing both numerically stable and very high performance implementations of GLMs for R. That's work is going on on GitHub. And uh, uh, I'm upset that like the only way to do really large scale, really fast, so GLMs are like logistic regression. I mean, it's the bread and butter of analysis. Everybody runs them all the time. And I'm upset that in order to do really large scale ones, there's no fast, high quality implementation available, free and open source. You've got to pay for like Revolution R. And they do have a very good, fast version, but it's black box, you know. I, I'd rather see, so we're, we're just about done with that, actually. In fact, tomorrow I'll be in Connecticut with Mike and we'll, hopefully we'll be finishing up some of those, some of those things and then, um, so, the, so, so look for that. There's gonna, we're gonna have some cool stuff on, on GLMs, and we're talking about trying to get our core, in fact, to incorporate some of our ideas, because there's some wonky things that R is doing that, that we discovered in the, it's not, not, not wrong, but uh, unnecessarily computationally expensive things that are being done in the GLM routine. Uh, as any one of you will know, if you tried to run GLM on a big problem, it's painful. Um, 
and, and then um, the other really exciting thing is uh, with some uh, several collaborators, including uh, this guy at Kent State here locally, Lothar Reichel. Uh, um, we've just implemented the beginnings of these large-scale network analysis methods, graph analysis methods in R. Um, and, and, and they're stunning, actually. Their performance is unbelievable. I, I was just at a finance conference, and um, on that piece of junk Chromebook, that's a really crappy computer that I use. Um, and on that machine, I downloaded the entire Bitcoin transaction graph. So every Bitcoin transaction, um, which it wasn't that many, 20 million or so. Uh, but the graph, was, so, so think of a Bitcoin ID as like a bank account. So it was like money flowed from this bank account to that bank account. And that's the node and the, you know, there's an edge that's pointing in that direction. So it's a directed graph of money flowing from one Bitcoin transaction ID to another. There were about seven million, six, six and a half million transaction IDs. So it's a sparse matrix that's six and a half million rows by six and a half million columns, big matrix, and about but mostly empty, only like 20 million things inside of it. So you use the sparse matrix package in R. But that's still big, right? That's like kind of big. And then we can answer with these new methods uh, questions like, what are the five most important? And important is defined as like most connected nodes in that, in that graph. I was able to compute that on that Chromebook in 70 seconds with these new methods on this piece of junk machine, which is like amazing. Um, you can also ask questions of these graphs like what, you know, which node should I start in on if I want to walk all of its paths and get the biggest coverage of the network? And those are questions that like the CDC asks when they want to allocate uh, vaccine uh, allotments around the country. Um, and so there's all kinds of really cool questions that can be answered with these methods and they're unbelievably efficient. And, the, the, and there will be a package on CRAN by the end of summer that we'll have all of them implemented and it'll be really nice. So you should, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll have to come back and talk about that because it's really mind-blowing stuff, really. Um, that was work that I'm doing independently of my day job. For I'm on a DARPA grant, so these creepy government weirdos want to know this kind of stuff too. Um, but the cool thing about DARPA is they let you do everything open source. In fact, it's a mandate. Like if you want to write code for DARPA, it has to be open source now, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so at least everybody can benefit from their evil ways. <laughs> so, all right, that's enough. Uh, thanks everybody for, for coming and thanks Tim for the laptop. I think I mentioned this before, but uh, we're pretty set on having a, an R workshop on a Saturday that's kind of like an intro to R, um, and then it goes into, I, I nice. think we're going to do some focus on the visualizations and things like that. The guy that's going to run that workshop is the guy that maintains, uh, it's called Stat Methods, it's a site called Quick R. Uh, oh yeah, I know that from Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. so, so he's, he's pretty excited to come down and share all that information. That's cool. That's very cool. Yes, yes, so we're pretty excited. Um, you know, it won't cost like most conferences. We're trying to keep it low, like $20 or so, just to make sure everyone can come. Um, other things I forgot to say earlier, uh, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Revolution Analytics, who uh, provides some of the funding, and the same with uh, Precision Dialogue, which is a marketing company in Westlake, helps uh, with the catering. Uh, and like Tim said earlier, we're always looking for speakers. So feel free to volunteer, let us know if you want to give a talk. Anything else? That's, that's everything. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, feel free to grab some food over there. I think there's some more. Thanks for your Oh, thank you. Thank you.